Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar presentation titled The Benefits of Using a Managed Service for Your Open Source Data Infrastructure, brought to you by InstaCluster. I would like to introduce you to today's presenter, Taylor Bleach. Taylor is a senior solutions engineer at InstaCluster and has spent half a decade working with open source technologies. At InstaCluster, Taylor works with clients and potential clients, helping with Apache Kafka, Apache Cassandra, Elasticsearch, Redis, and PostgreSQL. At this time, I'd like to pass it off to Taylor for his presentation. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming today. My name is Taylor. I'm a solutions engineer over here at InstaCluster. Work with a lot of clients on their open source software. Um, Today I'm going to go over what the what the uh, open source area landscape looks like um, and talk a lot about why using a managed provider is is what a lot of companies do um, and talk about the benefits between doing it yourself and working with a company like us or one of our competitors. Um, so to get started, InstaCluster was founded in about 2012. Um, our founders started with Apache Cassandra and then quickly realized that managed services for open source were actually, a, were actually widely in demand. Um, from there, we added Kafka, um, Elasticsearch, now OpenSearch, Redis, Postgres, and more. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. At the end, you'll have a small, short Q&A session, and I'll have my email in case you wanna reach out with any further questions. So just a quick overview of InstaCluster and what we do. Um, we are a exclusive open source um, company. We provide consulting, managed service, as well as support, um, really giving companies everything they need to run it themselves if they want via support and consulting or manage it for them and do everything for them to actually let them operate on it. Um, we are founded in Australia and are primarily Australian company with most of our employees in Australia, followed by the US and a few in Europe, um, which is growing as well. We have about 250 employees globally. Um, our headquarters is uh, Silicon Valley, and our customer count is above 300, growing every month. Most of those being Fortune 500, um, Fortune 1000 style companies, um, smaller companies with, with large data requirements. Uh, we have, it says over 150 million node hours. Like I got the updated number today. It's more like 120 million node hours. Um, as we grow, it, it scales exponentially. And I'm sure probably close to the five to 10 petabytes of data at this point. Um, we, we do host uh, managed solutions for some of the largest companies. Um, if you, many household names. Uh, we have a, we have a slide on names I can't, I am allowed to say, which I'll show in a minute. Um, we do uh, operate in the cloud and on-prem with our clients' data requirements and security requirements. It could be anything from a, a physical server in a, in a location. Um, it could be hosted one of the major cloud providers, or it could be which could be in their cloud environment or our cloud, cloud environment. So we're very flexible. Um, we have a 24-7, uh, we call it a tech ops team, but it's really 24-7 uh, on-call um, engineers who are usually working, um, say weekends, for example, they're, they're on-call. That act as a help desk for many large uh, open source issues, making sure our clients have 24-7 um, coverage for their critical systems. Um, so can I go ahead and move on from there? Just talk about some of our clients real quick, um, show what a lot of the people we work with. Um, so you can see here some pretty large companies. Uh, we do we do use our open source technology. We do host um, Kafka, for example, is, is a very common critical application. So a lot of these wow. systems are going to be with uh, companies' critical applications, where if they go down for more than a few minutes, um, it could be a big deal. Um, and companies, and that, and that is one of the reasons that we, we companies do come to us is they have critical operations that if they go down or they'll pay for support just because they know if they have issues um, every minute, every 10 minutes, every hour can be can be quite a large amount of money for them. Um, but just to give you guys an idea of who we do work with, uh, we're not working with small companies. These are large operations, large enterprises that are are outsourcing um, their open source. So it's not something small companies do, it's something that large companies do for, for various reasons. 
Um, so just real quick, what we support uh, primarily right now, we do Cassandra, Kafka, OpenSearch, um, which came out of Amazon after Elasticsearch became a little more closed off. Redis and Postgres, these, per, these are a majority of our business um, and are actually used by a lot of large companies. I was surprised when I found out how many household names use these platforms um, that are low, lower cost and um, compared to something like say Oracle SQL, um, which is for me a little old, but a lot of companies did use. A lot of companies are going from the paid enterprise software solutions from the large uh, technology providers to more open source technologies um, developed by a community of, of developers. Um, and we, we do add more. We have a few more coming on the way, but really the, the ones we add are according to demand. So if if we see a new technology popping up, then we'll, we'll go ahead and add it. Um, so getting more into open source, um, less about InstaCluster. So uh, open source technology is primarily technology that has been developed by a team. A lot of these will come out of big companies like Uber, Google. Um, often they are made by a large company to fix a specific problem. Kafka came out of LinkedIn. Um, and it's given to community, usually Apache. And then at that point, there are a number of contributors that keep developing it. Um, and people are actually allowed to join the team to per, to uh, to help contribute, et cetera. So it's it's really a community driven effort. Um, sometimes there is a large company behind them, say for Kafka, there's Confluent, um, for Elasticsearch, there's Elastic, which pushes it forward. Um, but a lot of the development is done by by developers for essentially no pay. Um, so it's really a community driven effort. Um, there are no license fees. The most common license is Apache 2.0, which essentially says you can use this software for any reason at no cost and do anything with it. Um, it's not controlled by a single vendor, even though a lot of companies will, the vendor, the, the original creators will create a company to, host, to provide services for it and back it to an extent um, and keep contributing. Um, so there are other softwares that are called open source. Um, as an example, we can use, uh, um, uh, say, MongoDB. Um, it's called open source. You really can't use it for free. Um, it's uh, You can use the source code, essentially. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of leave it there. But essentially, true open source to us is going to be software that is you can you can run for free, do almost anything with view the source code and if you want to um, depending on the projects and projects are harder to contribute to than others um, be a contributor um, to them so there is there is a difference in the open source softwares as well um, there are I'm going to keep this as, as not as a sales pitch at all if there's as little as possible um, but there's going to be uh, data stacks, for example, on Cassandra, Confluent, on Kafka, um, they we, it's called Open Core. So essentially, you'll pay for an enterprise, an enterprise version of the software, which includes higher license fees, um, which is a lot like going to different software vendor and buying their software, which could be good um, depending on the situation. Um, we at InstaCluster only run the full open source versions with no no license fees. Um, but in some situations that might be uh, might be a decision might be a good decision, but that's something you have to make. Um, but essentially, there are enterprise versions of Cassandra from DataStax, Kafka from Confluent, um, Elastic Search with Elastic um, that do provide uh, more benefits and, and higher functionality, but it comes at a at a, so at a software cost, which can be substantial. Um, a lot like buying enterprise software from a different vendor. Um, so true open source is going to be, in our opinion, uh, Apache 2.0 license, uh, MIT license, a couple others that um, that allow it for free use without any real um, hiccups. I mean, if you want to host it, if, if you want, you can hire who you want, host it where you want, edit it if you want to, um, etc. So there are open code vendors, um, which are actually very prevalent. Um, MongoDB, which is very widely used, CockroachDB, Elastic, which just switched their licensing to more of an open code um, license than a full open source license, which um, that decision was made 
based off the fact that Amazon was was hoping take was taking a lot of the business from from what it looked like uh, to host it through AWS. So, um, which I'm not surprised by their decision. Um, but so some of the reasons that companies actually outsource a lot of this, um, really the biggest reason we find is talent. Um, we'll, we'll have a we use an example. We'll say Coca Cola because they're huge. The technology director at Coca Cola, he wants to implement a Cassandra um, plat setup for let's just say geographic to show where deliveries are. Um, the issue here really comes down to finding talent is the hardest thing that we that clients tell us. There are only so many. For, well, to start, it's hard to hire software engineers. Um, I mean, they're they're hired up by Google and the big companies for a lot more than a lot of companies can hire them for. Um, so that's where they tend to head. But also, Cassandra is a very specialized technology. It takes, for us, we could probably teach it to somebody in six months to a year um, by fully immersing them in it. But for someone who does it occasionally, um, they might have they might have been pushed into a Cassandra DBA role, for example. It's going to take them a long time to learn, and there's only so many in the market. Um, and we, with these technologies so widely used, talent can be a real issue. So um, to, to, to stick a salary number on it, we can save maybe $125,000 a year um, for a relatively entry-level developer um, with a few years of experience. And then on top of that, they have to know Cassandra or Kafka or your technology. So one of the biggest issues is hiring talent. It takes It's hard to hire talent for these. And additionally, often they're used for critical applications. If the database can't go, if the database goes down, there's a huge issue that's going to happen with operations. So often it requires 24 seven um, coverage, which might require three or four engineers, even maybe two engineers if you wanted to, to do on call. But I don't think having one person on call every night is going to, is going to lead to a good situation unless it was very rare things happened. Um, so it's, it's just a hard position to fill. And when you are trying to get open source, you realize that the biggest blocker isn't how hard it is to do necessarily, but really to be finding the talent, finding the right talent. Um, we, we, we struggle, I shouldn't say struggle, we have a relatively hard time um, hiring people that already have the experience. So if we have that, our clients bring it up a lot. Um, the other reason as well is the actual cost of doing it. The actual cost of running a, a, a open source um, setup is often cost prohibitive. So if we'll, we'll put it at two or three developers, um, maybe to run a Kafka or Cassandra for a medium sized company, it's gonna be, I don't know, maybe four or $500,000 in salaries and benefits and everything else. Um, when if you just paid pre-cloud costs, if you just paid a managed service, even if you paid a couple hundred thousand dollars, you'd still be saving a lot of money. Um, so usually the economics and the lack of skill is what drives people to actually end up doing it themselves. Um, so also a few challenges, I'll keep this brief, but um, it's often hard scaling. Uh, technical debt can be an issue when you have a huge Kafka, Cassandra, Elasticsearch cluster, you do it wrong, you have to go back, redo it. Um, so learning from your mistakes as well can be a big issue if you're trying to have a small team set it up. Um, we did an estimate recently internally to estimate how long it would take to set up a Kafka cluster and we estimated it would be about nine months to, to take a team who understands Kafka to a little bit and actually learn everything they need to do to set up a Kafka cluster that is ready to use for a security wise, uh, scalability wise for a medium sized to large company um, usage. That was that was our personal estimate. It could be more, could be less, but we found it just took a long time to get through all the mistakes done as well. Um, so just a, a little bit quickly of what we do again, uh, to kind of go into the next part of the presentation, our managed platform, um, we essentially come in, we provide consulting services with the goal of managing it. And if you guys are a company that is, you think you can do it yourself, you are doing it yourself, but you want the extra support. We, we provide support contracts as well, um, which are best for critical applications. So if, say you're running a, a database that, that can't go down, you have an issue, um, quick email to us, open a ticket. Within 10 minutes, we are on a call with you, helping you fix it. Um, and, and just with the scale of these applications, it, it often, it, 
just can't go down. Okay, if it does go down, it needs to be fixed extremely quickly. Um, and that's where our support comes in. Is as well have engineers on call 24/7. If you have an issue, we'll even with wake somebody up at 2 a.m. on Christmas morning. Um, we'll we'll get that done. Um, so just a little bit more about the full managed service. Uh, we have four to five nines of of reliability depending on the exact product and scale. Um, 15 minute SLA times. Uh, we, have, and we have built in monitoring as well. So that's going to be a monitoring API. Um, we do monitor everything with most commonly, this is going to be an API to Prometheus and Grafana to view metrics in real time, um, set up alerting. If, you, if you're scaling up your cluster, you could set up the CPU usage to see how much can we use without burning it out. Um, security, uh, enterprise ready, highly secure. Um, Essentially, what we do is make it very easy for you to launch a cluster within five minutes, which I'll show later. Um, but turn it on, launch a cluster, and uh, get it running extremely quickly um, already with the security and, and scalability of, of being ready for the a large organization as well. Um, Cloudwise, we and many others run in most of the clouds. I would say most of our business is AWS, followed by GCP and Azure. Uh, I recommend usually AWS just because uh, Azure tends to cost more. I've heard nothing bad about them. It's just pricing can sometimes be a, a factor. Um, GCP, I I think is as good as AWS personally. I just don't, I haven't seen as many people use it probably because they their platform just isn't as popular. Um, AWS seems to be the, the primary cloud most people have and comes to mind first. Um, but GCP is still good, Azure. I like two, but it's just a little more expensive than the others. Um, also, we do on-prem. So if if you have a, a metal server in a data center, maybe even your own data center, um, that's something we often connect with and run for clients as well. Uh, DigitalOcean, which is, I think we've used once or twice. Um, we've actually hosted some through Heroku. Um, so it's we, we do have a very flexible via cloud and try to figure out what our clients want. and. Bring it to them. Um, there, so there is a service provided by Amazon primarily for manage Kafka, manage Elastic, now open the search, um, key spaces is comparable to Cassandra. And these are very legitimate, reliable, good, as far as I've seen services. Um, the main difference is when you provide these services, you are still running it. Say I'm at Amazon, I can't call up a Kafka or Cassandra expert. Kafka is running on a virtual machine, and you still have to set it up, or you still have to figure out how to run it right. Um, so that that's more of like if you guys know what you're doing already, and you are able to run it yourself, um, you can start it up, have the engineers do that. You're still gonna have to go through a learning curve, set it up, um, and the main thing is just you're not gonna have that those those engineers on staff. Um, I say on staff. I mean, our engineers, you could call up and, and treat a staff to get things done um, or manage service do it for you that you would have otherwise. So if, if that's something you're interested in, I mean, we, we generally don't compete with that. If, if I hear that on a call, I generally am not too worried. Um, if the client wants that or the prospect wants that, that's great. But at the end of the day, um, somebody who, who wants it running for them and to not worry about it is most likely going to choose a our managed service over Amazon's um, VMs with Kafka or Keyspaces running, for example. It's just it's, just, it's a different business model. Um, it's for different it's for different different type of prospects. Somebody who's looking for more of I know how to use it. I don't mind doing it myself. I just want it hosted for me. Um, versus what we do is we come in and do everything for you. And if you have questions, we'll show you what we're doing and explain it and change it as you as you see, as you wish. Um, so that's a little difference between a fully managed service and um, open source offered by the major cloud vendors. Again, not not a bad service, just really not what we offer. It's a little bit different, um, less touch, and you have to do a lot of the work yourself. Um, so that's preference, but a lot of most people do tend to go with a fully managed service once they realize what they what they have to do with the Amazon. Um, slides real quick but essentially uh biggest pain points are going to be complexity time and money um and and also at the end of the day if you're a manufacturer or an energy company do you really want to be worrying about running a kafka cluster instead of worrying about running an actual business um time it just it just takes a long time um and then as well 
scale isn't limited no issues with scale um, availability i mean tell us, tell us where you need it if you need a cluster in australia we can set up a, a cloud instance down there run it for you if you need if maybe you need europe and australia and us for latency reasons we can do that as well um, and then high performance we we can provide as much really as much cpu ram storage as, as necessary um, to the cloud providers wherever you need it and uh, our system we try to make our system as fast as possible um, so that's that's something um and then a difference between really the open closed source open core are going to be the providers who sell an additional like we'll call it a wrapper on top of the open source software um also not a bad not a bad business model um but often people we work with only want the open source software they go into open source to save money i mean if, i mean you could always call up oracle or one of the other large providers for something comparable if you want to pay millions in license fees or hundreds of thousands in license fees be my guest um but one of the things they try to avoid is uh is a is paying more so that's going to be there are additional features it might be a little better but you also get the big enterprise software bill that i'm sure a lot of it directors see kind of kind of their eyes their eyes widen and i'm and i've been at the at the end of charging that many times and it's uh it's not, not always something people have to pay for um so we provide our, our the only fee we provide is our service fee which is going to be on top of the cloud cost which is comparable to paying the uh the license fees not really fairly fairly minor um you're also locked in so if you're on a premium version of let's say kafka with confluent you are going to be kind of locked in with that um, or elastic if you go with elastic search you you really can't pay anybody else to host it for you you have to work with them and if that's what you want that's fine but um it's a lot like paying Oracle. If, if that's something you uh, you willingly do, um, then go for it. But um, we, for us, if you want to switch off of us, we're not going to fight you. If you want to run it yourself, if you maybe want to learn from us for a few years, learn to do it yourself, and then pass it off to your engineering team, we love you to stay with us. But we're completely fine if that's the way you decide to go. Um, benefits of managed service. Uh, just run through these real quick. So. One of the biggest things I think from seeing the inside of a, of a managed service provider for open source, um, not, not, a general, not a general MSP, but like what we, for specialized technology, um, th the biggest thing I think we can provide is economies of scale. So since we have engineers who, we have a lot of automated features, a lot of our system is automated. Um, our costs are much, much lower, expertise is there, and that's something you benefit from. So by, by paying us, you are essentially, you're benefiting from the economies of scale that we've developed to just streamline everything. Um, so it's just much, we have it, it's it's like a production line um, for our, our clusters. We, we can launch them very quickly. If we need something, we'll write the code for it. Uh, we even write patches if, if we, we see a bug somewhere and it just makes things very easy. And as a result, the costs are gonna be lower with us than trying to do it manually yourself, like trying to build a car yourself, like say, versus a buying from a car manufacturer. Um, Teams are on call 24-7. Uh, our, our engineers work with multiple clients, so you don't need to have one person on call or one person awake for minor issues. We have we have one person that is probably working with multiple clients that night, so it's really it's a lower, it can be a lower cost to to work with them. Um, and we do hire as much as we need to generally um, the the talent pipeline. Um, so the the average wait time for a SEV1 issue is probably about 10 minutes. If it's SEV three or four, then it could be longer, but that's gonna be something you don't need instantly anyways. Um, when you when you do any yourself, your knowledge is really only as good as your team. Um, our team, they're, they only operate, for example, our Kafka engineers only operate Kafka, so there could be issues that we've seen dozens of times. I might, might pop up once every five years for the average client. And when that happens, it's it's a little bit, that's the main reason people go support is for those odd issues that pop up and they can't figure out. Um, one less thing to worry about, you're actually running your business instead of actually worrying about running your your software. Um, that's that's a big thing is at what point do you just say, let somebody else do it. We don't want to be a Kafka running business. We just want to have a Kafka cluster for this use case. Um, better off doing what you guys are good at, making money in your in your field is often what we hear from a lot of people. And then a lot of these are critical applications. So if it just can't go down, I mean, I'm sure we've all heard about Facebook going down a few weeks ago or months ago. Um, 
I don't know how many how much money that was to them, probably hundreds of millions is my guess, but things like that is what we try is what we prevent by doing having a, uh, either support or managed service is just ensuring that these things don't stop and if they do, it's hopefully short lived. So uh just Common situations that people come to us. Um, most common one, as I just hear about, is on the calls is can't find the talent. Um, they've tried it, they failed, they've come to us. And, th and these are big names. These aren't these aren't um, small firms, say out of like Midwest manufacturing firms. These are large technology firms, actually, that we we meet with a lot that you often that are you often hear in the news is cutting edge, and they're and they talk to us and say they're they're running it, but it's just a large amount of work, and they and they just don't have the bandwidth um, to do it all. And it's just more complex than they thought. Uh, risk mitigation, again, having the proper, like an insurance policy. If, if a critical issue pops up, um, you can you could call someone to call instead of having your engineer on Stack Overflow trying to figure out what the how to fix it. Um, and then just the cost savings and company resources being spent in other areas. So being able to uh, to just not worry about it. Um, and also a big thing is they just take all their open source software, pack it all, package it all up. Maybe they take all their Cassandra or Postgres, Kafka, whatever, whatever they have. We have some clients who just we run essentially everything for them. So they'll have many of these setups throughout their entire company. They've been in different continents for different business divisions, departments, and they're just like, hey, can you just host everything for us? And and once we do a lot, but once we kind of establish that back and forth, um, and, and generally the more the, the more you host with any company the, the greater savings you get so at that point it, it, it's we act almost as like a department for them running all their stuff for them they get to know the engineers and it's just a it's like they're outsourcing part of their IT department um, works well for them um, I'm gonna go ahead and hop on a, on a quick demo of what looks like the launcher cluster in a minute um, just some more generally what it looks like I'm gonna go to security um, so security uh, stop two is is what we have or we are later this year we will have ISO 27001 and FedRAMP. Um, I know those are very important. ISO 27001 is the standard and the Fed, FedRAMP is often required to work with uh, government organizations. But we take security very seriously. Um, we do have PCI compliance for if you there's payment card data for Cassandra Kafka. Um, HIPAA compliance is something we can work around as well to be compliant for healthcare organizations. Um, a lot of just uh, user access security features, um, really just trying to get everything to the point where, I mean, we, security is good, um, but as we grow, things like the ISO and FedRAMP become more necessary to work in different areas and work with different clients, bigger clients. So, um, and then security-wise as well, we do a lot of uh, node encryption uh, or a lot of cluster security node encryption, um, Kafka, Cassandra, for example, there's, there's in, in different cases, there's encryption at rest. And while the data is sitting there, um, depending on the platform, some things aren't, are not possible. Um, so just a brief overview of security. Our SLAs, I just wanted to bring these up. Um, we average, for, if you, for production, uh, our Kafka is about five nines. So that's going to be, I haven't really seen better for Cassandra, 100% um, for local quorum consistency. Um, and that we try to, and, and our, for production, our, our developer, our best effort, but we still try to stick to the same, um, guidelines. So that's everything, uh, severity, sev4, sev3, sev2, sev1, um, I'm going to go into a demo right now. And then the final thing before the demo, um, of the, of the cluster I wanted to talk about is our monitoring and provisioning APIs. We have REST APIs for monitoring that are often connected to Grafana and Prometheus. Um, that's going to be if you want to watch your own clusters, if you want to set up your own alerts. And I, I, I like to say if there is a problem, we, we have our own alerting set up. We probably know about it before you do. Um, but if there is something you see that might be worrying, then uh, you can monitor it that way. And then provisioning. So if you want to provision new clusters or take down clusters, we actually have an API. You can put it into your code. Um, if you want, if you want to be spinning up clusters with code and running for certain things, maybe taking it down later. Um, and then any issues or support support tickets go out to our engineers. So it's a quick uh, quick message to get to them. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go over uh, a console demo right now. 
and show you guys how how quickly how easy it is to spin up a cluster um i have one created already because there is about a five minute provisioning time just to save that time I, i'm going to create one and then go to the one that's already been created um so when creating it pretty straightforward um you create create a kafka one because that's going to be probably the most common uh, kafka one we do have host apache zookeeper as well which can be used actually with other the systems not only kafka so if you guys have a different open source technology that needs zookeeper we can actually run that for you um and you can see all the other technologies up here as well um choose your cloud we do have others ibm cloud is a possibility heroku like i said on prem but if you want to do that you can contact us and we'll uh, we'll talk to you about how that works enterprise features these are going to add a little bump to the about 20 percent to the bill um, there's some on the next page as well but once you choose one they're all available so if you need payment card or private network cluster for to set up private ips um, with no public ips you can you can set that up um, for security pci has to be enabled through the uh, security settings um, pretty straightforward choose the version the version is in here uh, we, we generally don't put new versions up as they come out right away we generally give it a two to three month period to let other people find the bugs um and then after that we, we check it out and most of the time within two or three months let's say quarter a uh, fiscal quarter it will have the uh the version of kafka up if you want it earlier you can most likely do it for you and if you don't want to upgrade you don't have to stick you in an old version if, if you want to be on the last stable version that's completely fine maybe two stable versions back or maybe there's a version from five years ago that uh that has a feature you guys want to use um so we can we can set that up as well a um, bunch of options. The replication factor is important. Uh, if you don't know, standard is three for most systems. Um, this is this means that there's three copies of data distributed throughout all, all, most of our technologies. Or Kafka, Cassandra, and Elasticsearch, Open Search now are distributed, um, which means they're going to be across multiple different nodes, and all the data is going to be re replicated. Um, it is possible to not replicate it, but you don't provide our SLAs in that case, and um, there's a chance of data loss. So we recommend 3x replication factor. Really keeps it the, the data resilient and makes it very, very, very rare for anything to uh, to, to disappear. Um, encryption, dedicated Zookeeper. Uh, these are options, um, and then partitions per topic. We also have Kafka REST proxy schema registry as enterprise add-ons. These are the same as the enterprise features on the previous page, uh, flat 20% if you add any one of these, but once you add one, the rest are at no additional cost. Um, and then finally, the data center options. Um, choose a data center, Asia, EU, and there's probably some more we can do if that's something you need. Um, at REST encryption, we can set up number of nodes, which can, at the minimum has to be the number of has to be the replication factor but if you want say four nodes for for some reason we can do that um a lot of this is just for ease of use but if you have custom um custom re uh, requirements you can send us a ticket and we'll we'll set it up for you node selection we have pre-sized nodes the uh the best part about this is we ran kafka cassandra etc for a long time so all these nodes are optimized if you actually just take how much storage you're going to have 95% of the time, if you just match by storage, the RAM and CPU will match up pretty well. Um, that's something, so that's how I generally price things. So if you if you say we have one terabyte of data um, with a 3x replication factor, it's gonna be three terabytes. We generally want, we, we generally like to see a 30% buffer, which is a little bit high, but that ensures nothing will go wrong, as well as if a burst period happens, it won't crash the system or if a bunch of data gets added for some reason. Um, so with, with that one terabyte, I'd probably go with three of these, uh, three of these, which is about three point terabytes of data total, which is three terabytes for, uh, for replication plus a, a buffer. Um, that's probably what I would go with um, but for this. I'll get the smallest one. And then after all that, you can come here and it's, you can see everything, what you have. Um, Total cost, very transparent. Uh, the, the features, except the terms, and create a cluster. This can also be, all be done via API. So if if you guys want to just write a script to provision new new clusters for maybe you need it for a month, you can write a script, launch it, be set up really quickly instead of going through all this. Um, once the cluster is created, 
monitoring is straightforward. There is a monitoring, um, call, it, call it a monitoring panel. Um, and this is really only for display for you to take a quick look at. Most likely you have used the API to put it into, I recommend Prometheus and Grafana, Datadog, um, some of the other, can't think of any more, but there are a bunch of other monitoring tools you can, you can set up the, the REST API to connect to, um, set up alerting how you wish, just make it as pretty as you want. Um, but the data is here. Um, and there's a lot of different things, and even more through the API documentation, which I'll run through as well if there's time. Um, details, quickly see what's running, what are the roles, Zookeeper, this, these could be Cassandra nodes, open search nodes. Um, data centers, just everything you would need to, to want to see on your node. Um, settings, generally this is really just the uh, two-factor delete, which I'm sure as we all know is usually mostly to make sure that disgruntled employees, um, I shouldn't say disgruntled, that attackers as well, um, anybody who gets access, maybe, maybe somebody accesses an employee computer, maybe left it at a cafe, um, it just makes it so that we call you or email a certain person to confirm a cluster deletion. That just extra layer of security because someone can come here, enter the cluster name and delete it and it just, it could really go bad. So we recommend you use two-factor delete with, personally, I think a phone number to one of the executives <laughs> just to, to make sure nothing nothing gets deleted inadvertently. Um, firewall rules, you can allow addresses, uh, VPC peering, very simple to connect different cloud instances, in this case, the AWR cloud environments, AWS. Um, connection info, so you can see the public IPs, private IPs. Um, it's automatically load balanced. If you just connect it to one, it'll, it'll balance the loads between them. Um, and then just examples of code snippets that you can use to connect to the clusters, depending on your language of choice. Um, so. Uh, resizing, this is uh, very useful if you maybe you want to lower your usage or raise your usage, you can lower it pretty much on demand. Um, and this is going to migrate all your data over to a different node type. Um, the only time you can't use this is if you lock in with the cloud provider, say AWS for a year, and you're taking advantage of the discount that they provide, uh, which we pass on to you, the, the one-year lock-in or three-year lock-in, then you'd be locked into your current instance sizes because we're we're paying AWS for a year of that and then making and then giving it to you um, if we're running in our environment. So um, in this case, really you, as long as you're not locked in, you can resize, you can add nodes, which if you need more data, if you have more storage, the easiest way is just add one more node. So add one more node. Um, multiple, it says multiple of three, we can should be able to just Send a ticket, we'll, we'll add one more for you guys. And then users, um, you can add users, different types. So um, standard, which they can do read, write, read only, and then none, which like if you wanna have a place holder for maybe a new a new engineer until they until you get the background check back, for example, you can set that up. So that is most of the check the time, a few more minutes. Um, that is our, going to be our uh, console. It's very straightforward. Um, we do have documentation for the provisioning and the takes a second to load. Uh, for the provisioning API monitoring API, which I'll go over. Um, so as you can see, provisioning API, you can come in here set up to create a new cluster. Here's all the, everything you need. Um, we have the monitoring API, um, cluster level, data center level, node level, and et cetera. So it's very easy to, um, if you wanted to run these into a, say Prometheus, Grafana, and just set up alerting. Um, something else we, we, we personally do too, as you can do as well as pager duty is great for, um, if you want to get alerts, you can set up Twilio alerts um, through code. Uh, but PagerDuty we use to to, uh, to notify via calls and, and texts. Um, so in a minute we'll run into the questions. Um, that is a wide view of everything we do. Um, go over a few of these real quick. We have a few more minutes. Um, incident severity. So when you contact us, we'll have sev 
one to four. Sub one is going to be our systems are down. We need help right now. Sub four is going to be, hey, can you can you can you let us know if you support this? Um, or our plans do. Uh, and then most incidents are going to fall between sub two and three. Um, maybe there's a a small issue you need to fix sometime this month. Sub three, will, and, it, and this determines where in the queue it goes. So sub one we go to right away for all our clients, and then these will happen later. Um, as the sub one aren't around anymore. Um, so that's gonna be our presentation for today. I'll go ahead and open it up for questions, um, leave some time if there is anything that anybody wants to ask, um, go ahead and ask in the questions box, which I can, okay. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead, open up the questions if you wanna ask any questions um, also. If you want to contact me for any questions as well, um, here's my email, feel free to send it. And maybe you want to know more about a platform, maybe you want to see if that, that one is right to use. Um, happy to answer any questions or any comments on anything you saw today. Um, me... Awesome, Taylor. Thank you for your presentation um, and attendees, as he said. Um, if you do have questions for him, his um, email is on the screen, but you have him here right now live. So go ahead and ask your questions in the questions panel. Um, there are a few that we're going to start with here. And the first one reads, when you talk to a technology leader, what are the top reasons they have for coming to you for their issue? Um, I would say probably it's going to be lack of talent. They just have a hard time hiring talent. Um, and if they can't find it, it's going to be trying to poach it from somebody else. So that they're going to, the cost of hiring the talent, um, or if they can even convince them to, to leave their current employer is probably the biggest one. Um, that followed by we tried it and we failed. Um, or it's it's just taking too long if they give it to their engineers. Not that it is rocket science, it's just something that takes a long time to get set up properly probably going to be the biggest um, the biggest reason for if someone talks to us it's probably what they're going to one of the top reasons they say right okay so then if you are talking to say this technology leader and aside from price um, what do you see as the biggest advantage you have over um, other large open core players um I would probably say from other, we hear the service is often the biggest one. Or we try to we try to keep our our service levels high. Um, we often hear what I can compare, like if I say if they're working with a Confluent or a Elastic type company that the service levels are low. I I think they, those companies try to operate more as like an enterprise software company than a services company. Um, so often we'll talk to somebody and and their their biggest gripe is that they couldn't get they couldn't get the SLAs service-wise that they, they thought they were going to get or that they were agreed to or they thought it would be better. Um, that's one of the biggest reasons I think that we that we often come out ahead is just we we respond quicker and try to help people faster. Yeah, awesome. Sounds like definitely a huge advantage over the other um, large open core players. And then it looks like our last question here for you today is, what main mistakes do you see companies make after trying to do this themselves? Um, I think one of the biggest things that I personally see, if a company will bring us like what they're currently using is just, they use, they're just using a lot of cloud resources. Often I can come in and, and tell them right off the bat, you guys probably have a 25 to 40% more resources in AWS or Azure than you actually need at this point. So really we save one of the biggest points we when you talk to somebody as well is uh, the cloud costs there, that they have are just, they don't need to be that high. Um, they just, they have, they have more than they need. And if they just cut it down, nothing would change and they would save a lot of money depending on the size of their, uh, of their instance. Okay, awesome. It's good to know that there is a solution for their problems then, um, that being InstaCluster. So with that, uh, Dizon would like to thank you, Taylor, for your phenomenal presentation. Thank you. Um, my email is on the screen, so if anybody has anything else, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to connect to you and answer any questions or any comments on the presentation. Happy to help with anything. Great. 
And additionally, Design would like to thank InstaCluster for providing the audience with a great webinar. Lastly, thank you to everyone who attended today. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career. Have a great day. Thanks.